Alma Kamara, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. It's nice to be on your program. <laughs> well, we're, we're happy to have you here. So tell us about this incident that happened on a flight that you were on recently with your partner and just really relay the, the incident. Yeah. Well, we got onto this flight that was from uh, Santa Rosa back to Seattle. It was at the beginning of June and uh, the plane was full. But because Paula, who is now my wife, um, was disabled, she is disabled and has trouble with mobility, we got seated on in our seats at the sort of halfway to the back of the plane before everybody else got on. And we had two seats that were, you know, the plane had two, two seats on each side of the aisle. And I had chosen when I got the plane tickets, seats that were with Paula on one side of the aisle and me on the other side of the aisle. Yeah, so, so facilitate her, if, her right, in and out, yeah. Right, right. And, and you know, I like the aisle seat. I like to you get up and use the bathroom and not have to crawl over people. But so we're sitting in the seats already when the rest of the passengers start coming onto the plane. And, and one of the last sets of people are this couple, this white couple where the guy is like six foot three and 300 pounds. Ooh. And his wife, who, who's like an average uh, Caucasian couple, right? <laughs> and apparently he had the seat on the window seat side of Paula and the wife had the seat on the window side seat of me. So he comes up to me or he comes up and he says, wouldn't you both, wouldn't you like to sit together with your friend here? And wouldn't you like to have the window seat so you can look out the window? And, <laughs> and I look at him and I say, no, I like the aisle seat. I chose the aisle seat and I want to stay here. And he wouldn't take no for an answer. For, so he like says, well, why, why won't you give me your seat? So he immediately got aggressive. Immediately. Like I had to explain to him and justify to him why it was that I wasn't willing to give up my seat and, you know, have this wonderful window seat <laughs> that he thought would be so wonderful. For so the, is this have. guy just looming over you, right? He's, the... he's looming over me, like, like in my face. And I'm like, no, I don't want to give up my seat. So, so then he wouldn't take no for an answer twice more. He's like, well, why won't you give me your seat? Why won't you give it up? I mean, why do you need this seat? And and it's like, I I'm like, why do I have to explain this? Well, like, was the plane fully boarded at this point, and he was just yeah okay yeah they they were like one of the last sets of people to board. So and and the plane was full. This was like at the beginning of June. So um so then he proceeds to like sort of you know mope and groan and and push his way into the sea his his wife at this point is totally silent like you know he's pushed her around yeah and she doesn't really want to get involved so he sits next to paula and i look over at paula and him and he's like glaring at me <laughs> get, giving me stink eye <laughs> And I'm like, uh, you know what? I don't know why you're you're acting like I'm supposed to give up your seat. It's it was my seat to have. And he starts going into that whole thing again of, well, you know, you should give up your seat to have this window seat. And why did you why do you have to have the aisle seat? And at this point, you know, our voices are raised 
and a couple of flight attendants come by and they say to him, you know, she, you can ask, but it's her seat. She doesn't have to give it up. You paid for you. the seat. You paid I for paid, the seat. I paid for it. And I got, you know, I got the reservations early enough that I could choose the seat. So I say to the flight attendant, well, you know, this guy is really trying to intimidate me and, and bully me into giving me his seat. He's giving me, he's sitting there giving me stink eye, <laughs> acting like he could exercise his white male privilege to take over the seat from this, you know, here I am four foot nine Japanese woman. And clearly he, you know, I think about it, he would not have done that to another white man. He, oh, I think sure. he, yeah. he only did it because he felt like, you know, here's this little Japanese woman. I probably didn't even know I was Japanese, but probably just figured he he's throughout his life been able to bully people and doing into doing what he wanted. So he thought he could do the same with me. And, you know, it's like when I said to the flight attendant, he was trying to exercise his white male privilege. He like had this total look of surprise, like, <laughs> oh, no, no, that was never my intention. But then the whole rest of the flight, he has his leg stuck in the seat in front of Paula's and his armrest hanging over on uh, his arm hanging on the armrest between them sort of like to remind her that I wouldn't give up my seat to him. So in other words, guy was being a complete asshole. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, so do you think that that is, I mean, what part of it was racial? Do you think there was a racial component to it as well as a white privilege? I, I mean, I can only assume and, and, you know, when I think about it, as I said, I don't think he would have done it to a white male. I, 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 he could have done it to another woman who was not Asian, but you know, I think it, it, my being Asian probably gave him extra permission. Well, because you're supposed to be submissive. That's right, exactly. <laughs> well, and then physically, what was he? You said he was like six three. Yeah, six three, maybe three hundred pounds. He was, so, so or, there, or at least I, he became bigger the more the longer he sat in that. He's one of those guys that they call tiny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like one of those animals that they kind of rise up to make themselves yeah, bigger yeah, and just yeah, trying to yeah. intimidate themselves. Yeah, and yeah. you're all of what four nine, I guess. Four nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. how did this then? Was this throughout the whole flight that he just spent his time intimidating? He didn't have anything better to do. Well, well, I think he quit staring and blaring and giving me stink eye once the flight attendants left, but he kept lording his body over Paula's seat the whole rest of the flight. And then at the end of the flight, once you went to get off, what happened? Anything? Um, any, more, any more words? No, no. I, I think that, well, what we did, though, was because Paula has mobility problems and she has a cane, right? Um, as the plane is unloading, I, we decided that we'll wait till everybody else gets off. So I said to Paula, why don't we let these guys go off first? So she sort of hobbles up and un undoes her cane and, and sort of hobbles back to give them room to move out. And I don't think he realized until that point that she really was disabled, even though, you know, when he was asking me to move and why I wouldn't move, I did say she's disabled, but it probably didn't occur to him or didn't dawn on him that part of the reason that we don't want to move was because she's disabled. And I would have imagined that once he saw her trying to move, he may have realized that he was trying to push around not only me, but the disabled person. You know, we've all seen the, the, the videos, you know, the Karen videos on YouTube. Did you ever imagine yourself to be in one of those situations? 
Or that you're thinking, oh, man, I'm going to be on a video here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure someone recorded it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I had no idea. I, it just seemed like what kind of nerve this guy had to think he could push his way around. It, do, do you feel like it? It there's a there's some civility issues right now in society that this was just part of. I mean, does are you on a little bit more alert because of this incident? Oh yeah. Well, and you know, it's partly because of our former president who gave permission to these types of people to who who makes them think that they have permission to push around people like me, you know? And were you even more concerned being an Asian woman and during the time when we've had, you know, attacks in the Asian, on Asians? You know, just because I, of who I am and, you know, I, I've been an attorney for 40 years now and I've, been in courtrooms where I've had other attorneys who are much larger than I am who's tried to intimidate me and I just kind of stand my ground. I have learned not to allow people to push me around even though they're more physically able and you know I'm a power lifter and <laughs> so I don't get pushed around. I, I have this demeanor of being somebody that you don't want to push around, but people who don't know that about me. And, you know, I was already sitting down when this guy came up to me. He didn't know what he was dealing with or who he was dealing with, but no, I, I had not been overly concerned about the Asian rise in Asian hate crimes. I just sort of, was never it never crossed my mind that I would be a victim in that way. Okay, so admit it. Were you thinking about okay? Am I going to have to body slam this guy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I would have done that on oh, an airplane. Man. But it just now, points I would out that, seen that but anyway. it just points out that you know large white guys feel that any space they're in, they're their master. It's just so weird. I mean, you see that all the time. So I commend you for standing your ground and taking this guy to task because it's just bullshit. I'm, I'm sick of it all. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm glad that you think I did the right thing. Oh, yeah. You know, if you paid for it, you, yeah. you have every right to do what you were doing. And, and uh, you know, nobody should mess with you in that respect. Plus the fact that, uh, oh, man, I still would have like to have seen your body <laughs> <laughs> well i i i wonder how many other asian women right. would have given up their seats to him i mean paula was ready to give up her seat and move over or you know i mean she was willing to trade seats with his wife and i'm like no no you don't need to do that yeah. I mean, she yeah. just doesn't like confrontation right no, well, I totally and, get it. You know, and, and it, it, let's face it, it was like a two hour flight. I mean, if yeah. he can't be away from his wife two seats away, I mean, I'm sure she was relieved <laughs> <laughs> not to sit next to him. Yeah. Oh, probably. She's probably thinking, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, the whole entire flight, she did not even look at me. Well, of course, she was mortified because I'm sure this is not the first time. It's happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, good for you. Way to stand your ground. Oh, well, thank you. Um, hey, you take care of yourself and uh, anybody else who wants to mess with you, they better look out. Just body, right. body slam them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Rolina Joseph, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, so we are in such an unusual time. <laughs> the last year and a half has been unusual. But it seems this civility these days is challenged. And, and this is not an issue, I think, that, that is new. But, but more and more as a divided country, uh, it seems like people just easily act out anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that? Do you feel that? 
Yeah, I think absolutely that um, a lot of folks are are done, right? I think that a lot of folks are, are really um, exhausted in lots of different ways. Uh, we are more divided from each other than ever before. And um, people are have very short fuses and are acting out in a variety of ways. Well, do you think that is a, a, a the factor is that we were shut down and people just tend to silo themselves in, in social media, which is, you know, we all know is a rabbit hole that just doesn't end. I mean, how much of that has played into it? Because I don't buy the, the, the whole idea of we've forgotten how to act in a civil society. I, I just don't buy that at all. I think that, that it's certainly the effect of being siloed, but it's in the, uh, the effect of being siloed at the tail end of, um, of 45 right, of yeah. a president who was who was fomenting hate around the country and was encouraging bad behavior, right, was modeling bad behavior for everyone. And, and um, still is, actually. Right, and still is. We're trying to ignore him and <laughs> I give him any That's why any we're just saying time. 45, right? <laughs> precisely, precisely. He doesn't deserve a name from us. Um, but, I, but, I, but I think that... that um, this was not the way that many people were taught to to actually behave and to see at the highest levels that we had, uh, you know, someone who was who was mocking. I mean, we don't need to go through the litany, right? Was was spouting racism, mocking people who were disabled. All of the different things that we saw meant that it was absolutely um, permissible for an everyday person to act out in all the same ways. And I think it seemed like it was encouraged as a badge of honor to do it. And even mm. to some degree still is by groups of people. Uh, and let's let's face it, look at what happened on January 6th. Yes. Right. When when everything came to a head at that moment, that was that was absolutely encouraged in. Yeah. yeah. What, what what is going on from a sociological with psychological standpoint that people actually allow themselves to do this? You know, like uh, the example that we had earlier in the show with Alma Kimura, you know, why do people why do people do this? I mean, I just don't get it. I think that that while we have a, a segment of people who feel like they finally had a voice with our past presidents, there are also many other people that are feeling um, victimized, right? Um, white entitled people who are feeling quite victimized at this moment. And, um, and so the way in which they try and regain their power is by acting out on folks like your friend, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and trying to, to take back their power in these um, incredibly uh, bullying ways um, that are often violent in nature. Uh, we see this in, in so many different different aspects and that, that um, we see this in the fights right now against critical race theory, right? Right. And the desires to not understand uh, things like racism as anything other than individual and also in the past. And, and they're angry. Right. They're angry at all the things that we have known forever. Right. And that our families have known forever. And also, I think they're scared. They're scared potentially that we are at a tipping point. We're at a moment of change. We I just hope had we a, a, I, I hope so, too. Um, we've had this moment, you know, this this year of, of people have been calling it the spiritual reckoning. I hope it's true. But certainly it's it's it, it, things are not going to go back in the same way. And I think that's terrifying to those who have held on so closely to power for so long. You know, what's interesting is that I've, I, I, a lot of young people today now, you know, obviously are speaking out and I think they're the reason why hopefully things won't go back. Um, but there's even infighting there that's happening about, are you black enough? Are you Latino enough? Are you, are Asians really people of color? And which is creating other bits of friction among groups that are really have the same uh, issues that they're dealing with when it comes to prejudice, discrimination, and, and racial injustice. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is definitely not a, a white versus a POC issue. That This is a moment in which we are seeing all kinds of authenticity politics that are coming back um, in a way that I think have echoes of the 60s, but, um, but also are really kind of unique to this moment, They're really unique to a social media moment as well. I mean, talk about a place where people can have all kinds of bad behaviors uh, <laughs> in, in, in ways that sometimes it feels like um, they 
they never have to experience any consequences for, right? So yeah, I think that there's a lot of um, there's there's a lot of a a historicity, right, and not acknowledging um, the connected fates of so many people of erasing indigenous folks from this fight, right? Of of not understanding the ways in which we all work together, um, and that that anti-black racism, anti-Latinx racism, anti-Asian American racism, anti-indigenous racism, that all of these things um, are created and constructed together. And so we need to actually come together to create solutions. Uh, and I think that's really one of the, um, the, the most frustrating points of uh, right now. And I, I, I appreciate all of the young folks that are pushing back and that are pushing us constantly, that are making us do the incredibly important intersectional work, um, that are making us remember LGBTQ issues at the center and the way in which, you know, um, have not been at the center. And, and yet uh, the closing out of community makes me scared. It makes me really scared. So how has yeah. this affected what you do? Uh, because, you know, you help create the Center for Communication, Difference and Equity and uh, this Interrupting Privilege Program. Uh, how has the these bits of conflict within each each group then affected the conversations that you have? Well, on, on certain levels, people don't want to even enter into the space. So I'll give you an example. So for our Interrupting Privilege Program, um, we bring together folks to have conversations, um, intergenerational conversations around race and privilege. We had a couple of members um, of, um, of, of uh, the police department um, who were black police officers who participated in our dialogue program. They are wonderful individuals. They've been a part of our program for a couple of years. We um, then share out our dialogues and invite people to listening parties. Just having police officers as a part of the listening project, um, not, not working actually even in any type of a politicized way, meant that there were groups of people who told me we will not enter into the space. Yes, we, yes. We don't, we don't even feel safe being there, hearing stories of police officers. And to me, this was an incredible shame because first off, the police officers were talking about their experiences of racism their experiences mm -hmm. of racism within the police department, their experiences of, um, of vulnerability at this moment, right? They're kind of questioning what they are, are, are doing. Um, their, their feelings of, of seeing, seeing George Floyd murdered over and over and over again on television. But we don't want people who can even be in the space and feel uncomfortable and talk about that. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that the whole cancel culture thing is just sad to me because it, it doesn't create any dialogue. And I get I get what it's about. The, the part about that that bothers me the most is I, I'm always a person that says, you can say what you want to say, believe what you want to believe, you know, because everybody is working towards some process. But to call other people out, I think is harsh, unless it's something really bad, you know, like... Uh, that's unacceptable, but this cancel culture thing is just, I don't see it going anywhere. Well, I, I think that in terms of it being a moment of accountability, I'm okay with it, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with, um, with it not always sounding, sounding soft and sounding quiet. I'm okay with people having angry yes. voices, right? Yes. And especially if we've been talking about racialized violence, um, people are angry and they're, and they're angry for a reason. Uh, but what I have a problem is, is with people then just leave it, like right. stay, stay, let's, let's try and work this out. Let's try and talk about solutions together. Um, but if you can't, I mean, I think that that's the problem with, with canceling, because that means that you're, you're completely out of our circle. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and as we keep on making smaller and smaller and smaller circles of people that are kind of more and more and more like us in these tiny infinite, infinitesimal ways, uh, we can't create solutions that are going to really make change. And that's what we need. I, I don't think we can accomplish anything if we don't hear about the past to understand what we might be able to achieve together in the future. And so when Absolutely. you cancel everybody out like that, and particularly people of color that have had to deal with stuff like in the business, Matt and I 
spent oh, 40 yeah. plus years in, oftentimes we're the only ones in your mm -hmm. acad academic work. I'm sure it's the same one, mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we've experienced is, and, and actually that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this podcast, to talk openly and without any code switching, what we had to deal with and others as well. So mm -hmm. I, I think that we, we don't gain anything if, if we cancel. That, that just is worth having yeah. happen. So what are, you, what are you encouraging now with students or what would you say with people that run into these types of situations? I think that what we we all need to take a breath. I think that's one of the interesting things <laughs> of this moment. No kidding. Yeah. We we all need to really take a breath um and and understand that that people have been traumatized um that we have had many of us have had um family members, friends, um uh many who have died over the last year that people have experiencing have been experiencing racial trauma and so we need to take a breath around that. Um and if we're experiencing bad behavior, I think we can try and pause and at that moment think, okay, um, is it me? Did I do something in this moment, right? And, 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 and step back and not automatically add fuel to the fire, right? Um, and, then, and then step away, and then step away. Also not feel like you have to solve everything. In the case of your friend, that was impossible. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know, you're, you're literally stuck on, on an airplane with someone. But I think that um, in this moment where it feels like and people are bringing this to me, that, that there are other folks that are really just trying to um, to cause fights. You can also just step step away, step away from the keyboard is what I'm always telling my students. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, is, are you actually gaining anything um, by by creating these these constant kind of fights and, and starting these diatribes online? I don't right. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, Lena Joseph, thank you so much for your insights and uh, continue uh, doing your great work there at the University of Washington. Even though I'm a coog and what's his face over there is a <laughs> I'm a duck. And, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but we uh, really do appreciate your work and admire it. And thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.